Hallelujah. Let's start start off in prayer. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, and I just pray for your anointing. We need your Holy Spirit to bring clarity to your word, to bring life to your word. We all need to hear the word of God. We need to hear what your word says. We need to hear what your spirit speaks, Lord. So we just ask you, Lord, to open our hearts this morning. Amen. Well, this morning I want to speak about the fear of the Lord. Now, that's a huge topic. We could spend weeks and weeks and weeks. So I want to just touch on a few small aspects of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 33, verses 5 and 6 says this. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be established, the stability of your times, and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Wisdom and knowledge are associated with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is also related to the stability of your times. And the Hebrew word stability means a sure foundation. In other words, the fear of the Lord is what keeps us from being shaken, moved, or knocked off course. Isaiah Isaiah 33, 6 also describes the fear of the Lord as his treasure. The Hebrew word for treasure can mean a treasure house, a treasury, a storehouse, where things of great value can be stored without fear of them being lost or stolen. The Hebrew word for treasure can also refer to the precious things that are stored in the treasury. Thus, the fear of the Lord is both that precious treasure God has given us, as well as a storehouse in which we can safeguard it. In other words, the fear of the Lord is a place where we can protect things, but the fear of the Lord is actually a treasure in itself. Linking the fear of the Lord with wisdom, knowledge, and stability really provides us with insights why the fear of the Lord is a treasury, a storehouse, a place of protection. When a person lacks wisdom, knowledge, and stability, the very precious things God gives them are easily lost. Proverbs 1.7 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge because by the fear of the Lord we will not take for granted the things God has given us. God provides knowledge so that we will be able to recognize those things he has given us and we'll know that they are indeed very precious and valuable. So knowledge is recognizing the value of something. That's one of the definitions of of knowledge. Many times God gives us insights into his word or very wonderful experiences of his love and presence But instead of treasuring those things so we can daily be refreshed by them, we soon take them for granted and forget about them. We neglect the value those things are that God has given us. The impact of those wonderful experiences or revelations that we we have had from God simply fade away from our hearts and minds. Those wonderful insights into his word or those times he has miraculously answered our prayers have been given to us so that we can spend time each day meditating and remembering them. As a result, our hearts will be filled with both joy and awe and our faith and confidence in him will grow even stronger. Also, in Proverbs 1.11, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. We can find Christians who know how they should live, but don't actually do it. And so it can be said they have knowledge, but they lack wisdom, and thus they can be considered foolish. In other words, you ever met Christians? They can quote Bible verses, they can explain scriptures, but their lives don't line up. They're still doing the wrong thing. So you can say they have knowledge, but they don't have any wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because it actually motivates us to obey God's commandments and to keep his word. See, the fear of the Lord brings the reality of God so what we know we should do, we actually do because, wow, God, you're real. And the fear of the Lord actually motivates us to do the things we know we should be doing. Christians know we should spend time in prayer, but many Christians don't spend time in prayer. Christians know they should spend time in the word to understand God's ways, but they don't actually do it. They have the knowledge they should do it, but they don't have the wisdom to actually do it because they, were, they, they lack the fear of the Lord. God provides wisdom so that we will carry out the steps that need to be taken so that those treasures that he has given us will be protected from loss or theft because the devil is both a thief and a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
When we have both wisdom and knowledge, it provides stability and a sure foundation on which we can build our lives. So that's one aspect of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11.3 says this, talking about Jesus, His delight is the fear of the Lord, and He shall not judge by the sight of His eyes, nor decide by the hearing of His ears. The scripture speaks prophetically about Jesus and clearly states that he has, the fear, he has the fear of the Lord. If Jesus has the fear of the Lord and he's the son of God, how much more do we need the fear of the Lord? Another important thing we can learn about the fear of the Lord from Isaiah 11.3 is his delight is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord brings a delight to our souls and enables us to enjoy life to the fullest. So the fear of the Lord is not a negative, it's a positive. It's the thing that helps us actually to enjoy life. Christians who don't have the fear of the Lord are generally dissatisfied with their relationship with God. They look for other activities or possessions to fill the void and some of those counterfeits can be very destructive to their lives. Without the fear of the Lord, we will live lukewarm lives at best or lives filled with dissipation and immorality at worst. When Christians seek to please the flesh, it is because they're either bored or trying to flee from the painful circumstances of their lives. So the fear of the Lord brings a joy because it's God is real. But we can be born again, but we can lose the reality of God's presence. And we come to church and we think, okay, I've done my thing because we've lost the reality of God's presence and no longer is a delight. But when you have the reality of God, you come with expectation and God does not disappoint. Amen. When we come, my brother George, St. George as I call him, <laughs> our good Anglican minister, <laughs> Um, he says that when we have expectation, we come with expectation, God will not disappoint. The answer to our struggles against temptation is the fear of the Lord because it produces a, a deep delight and satisfaction in our hearts. It fills the void so we no longer need or want to walk in sin. There's two things the world wants to know. When, pe when people come to a church that are not Christians, there's two things they want to know. They don't want to know about rituals. They don't want to know about theology. They want to know two things. Is there really a God and can I know him? That's what they want to know. Is there really a God and can I know them, him? It's not like, well, let's do this ritual or talk about theology or, or standing up and sitting down or reciting, reciting some creed. They want to go, is God real and can I really have a relationship with him? That's the question that they, they seek. You know, when 9-11 hit in the States, the next week, the churches were filled. All the denominations were filled with people. Filled! But within a couple of weeks, they were empty again. You know why they went in? They're saying, we need to have answers. What is happening in the world? Is there really a God? Can I really know him? Can my life have, really have purpose in all this chaos? And a lot of those churches just had traditions. And so the people left because there was no reality. So the fear of the Lord is that reality of God. The most basic definition of the fear of the Lord is being conscious of the reality of God. The most basic definition of the fear of the Lord is being conscious of the reality of God. That's the fear of God. God is real. He is real right now. The fear of the Lord can run an entire spectrum of experiences and emotions. In John 13, verses 23 to 25, John 13, verses 23 to 25. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Apostle John at the Last Supper is depicted lying on the chest of the Lord Jesus. Imagine being so close to our God our Creator, and our Savior. When Apostle John was enjoying Jesus' presence at the Last Supper, could we say he was experiencing the fear of the Lord? Absolutely. Because the fear of the Lord is being conscious of the reality and the presence of God. We need to remember that the fear of the Lord is a delight. And the reality and the delight of being with Jesus is more wonderful than anything else. So you imagine the Last Supper where Peter says to John, John is sitting right beside Jesus. And Peter says to John, you know, who is this one that's going to betray him that, that Jesus is speaking about? 
And you know what Jesus does? He leans right over it, leans right on his chest and says, Jesus, who is it that you're speaking about? What a wonderful experience of God's presence. What a wonderful way that we, as believers, can enter into prayer. That's why prayer is enjoyable. That's why you can pray for hours. I, before, praying for five minutes was agonizingly long. But now I can pray for one or two hours, and it's not a problem because I'm enjoying the reality of God's presence. That is the fear of the Lord. But I'm enjoying it. I'm leaning into the Lord and just sharing my heart and letting Him comfort me. And that's what my encouragement for each one of you. I don't know what your experiences are with the Lord. Maybe some of you don't know the Lord, but for those who do, I spent 17 years not knowing the joy of just enjoying leaning into Jesus. Just being with the Lord and sharing my heart and Him sharing His heart with me. In Revelation... 1718, we see a different experience. John, the apostle again, has an open vision of Jesus, and he sees Jesus in his glory. And after he sees him, this is what happens. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he lay his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Since God is so infinite and our experience of Him can take on so many innumerable forms. In Revelation 1, 17, 18, the same Apostle John who lay on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper, enjoying being close to Him, now comes to face to face with Jesus Christ in His glory and He fell at His feet as dead. And if you read the verses just before, it talks about the glory that Christ appeared. He had this open vision and He saw Jesus. The presence of God can be so overpowering that John not only fell down before him, but was incapable of even moving as he lay almost lifeless at his feet. As John lay at Jesus' feet trembling with fear at seeing him in his glory, Jesus, in an act of deep love and tenderness for his beloved friend, reaches down and lays his right hand on him and says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. In other words, there's a reality of God that sometimes evangelical churches don't teach about. It's the awesomeness of God's presence. Like God is God. And sometimes I've had a few experiences where I have been overwhelmed by the presence of God. And God is so awesome. You know, God, He's our Savior, He's our King, He's our Father, He's our friend, but He's not our buddy. We don't treat Him with disdain. So I'll see you sometime, buddy. He's our friend, but he's not our buddy. In other words, there's an awesomeness of God. And there's something lacking sometimes when we don't see him in his awesomeness. Because that is where we lack the fear of the Lord. And we begin to do things and live ways we shouldn't live and things we shouldn't be doing. But there it is Jesus. And so John, who a few years before had been with Jesus, leaning on his chest. When he sees Jesus in his glory, he is overwhelmed by the reality of God's presence, the reality of who God is. Like, wow, God is infinite. He's the one who dwells in timelessness and eternity. And so John falls on the ground as if dead. And you know what Jesus does? He reaches out and he lays his hand on him. But not just any hand, his right hand. He lays his hand on John and he says to John, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Isn't that wonderful? Such tenderness. Jesus is still John's friend. Even when John saw the glory of God and he thought he was undone, Jesus lays his hand on him, his right hand, and says, It's okay. Don't be afraid. Jesus' words of comfort go far beyond telling John not to be afraid. He reminds him of his great sacrifice and victory so that he can be fully confident that he's truly righteous before God. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus says this. He says, I died for your sins 
And I've risen from the dead. And I've taken back the keys of death and hell. And what are you saying? You're righteous. You're righteous. When we come face to face with the reality of God, we may think, who am I to stand in God's presence? Who am I to stand in God's presence? And he says, I died for your sins and I'm risen from the dead. You are righteous before me. You don't have to tremble before me. You don't have to have doubts. You can know that you are the righteous of Christ because I've given you my righteousness. Don't be afraid. You can stand up because you have the righteousness of God. In John chapter 20, we see another illustration, for example, 27 and 28 verse. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, and, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas, just hours before, has said in an irre irrelevant, irreverent tone, when hearing about the reports of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I'll only believe if I put my hands in his wounds. So there was Thomas a few hours before. They said, we've seen him. He's alive. And he goes, I don't believe it. I, I don't believe it. And he says, you know, I'll only believe it if I stick my hands right in his wounds. Jesus then appears, and instead of rebuking him harshly for his unbelief and irreverent words he says reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side do not be unbelieving but believing Thomas response says it all my Lord and my God my Lord and my God Thomas went from being a sarcastic skeptic to being filled with the fear of the Lord as he encountered the reality of the resurrected Savior I am confident that this one encounter with the resurrected Christ was enough to transform Thomas' life forever and to make the fear of the Lord real to him. You know, he had the fear of the Lord that moon, don't you think? He was saying, You are really God! You are really God! Because he saw him dead, and now he appeared in his resurrected, glorified body. And he goes, You are God! But Jesus is so tender. He didn't rebuke him harshly. He says, if you need to, stick your hand into my side. Wow. This story illustrates another aspect of the fear of the Lord that will help us to live holy and consecrated lives for the glory of God. God is always with us, and he sees and hears everything. You know, after this moment... I think Thomas, after this encounter, would have thought twice before he would have spoken or acted rashly again. And the words of Jesus' teaching would have taken on new meaning. For there's nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. In other words, you know, many times, I don't know how you are, but even as a pastor, sometimes we say things in private, we think, that's not very nice, is it? Now, I know nobody else does that except for me. <laughs> but the thing is, and the reason is, we lack the fear of the Lord. See, Thomas, a few hours before, didn't recognize that not only was Jesus resurrected, but because he's God, he knows everything and hears everything and sees everything and knows what we're thinking. Right? So a few hours before, he said, well, there's the only one way you're going to believe if, if he comes and I put my hand in his wound. Well, when Jesus appears, he goes, he was listening to me. <laughs> he was listening to me. But he's not only listening to you, he knows your very thoughts. And that is another aspect of the fear of the Lord. It will help you in how you act, what you say, and what you even think. See how important the fear of the Lord is? It will set you free. Proverbs 16.6 
In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Now we understand, by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. One of the strongest ways to overcome sin and compromise is the fear of the Lord. When we're conscious of the reality of God in every circumstance, we will find a new strength and resolve to depart or flee from evil and temptation. When a Christian starts to walk in sin, it's because they've lost the fear of the Lord and they're not recognizing the reality of God when they're in the middle of temptation. The fear of the Lord will give us the strength to say no to self. We need to say no to self. We need to say no to our selfishness. You know, sin is like mushrooms. They both grow in the dark. And if you are, are aware of the reality of God, you will have a power to reject sin. You will have an authority to, f to flee from evil. In Genesis 39, 9, the story is a story of Joseph. And in this story, we know that Potiphar's wife was eyeing Joseph and wanted to commit adultery. And this was Joseph's response. Genesis 39, 9. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? When Potiphar's wife was trying to seduce Joseph, he was able to flee from temptation because he had the fear of the Lord. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Wow. God is real. And Joseph knew the reality of God. And in the midst of that temptation, he didn't, if he spent another minute in that place, he would have been an adulterer. <coughs> But when she came and tried to seduce him, he immediately was always conscious of the reality of God. And how can I do this and sin against God who sees me right now? How can I do this towards my God? Against my God? And because of that, he was able to flee temptation. Because another minute, he would have been an adulterer. But he immediately fled. Many times as Christians, we treat Jesus' suffering and death for us at Calvary very lightly, as if it has little consequence. Not so much by our words, but by the way we live our lives. You know, if you say to a Christian, you think what Jesus did for us on the cross is so wonderful, so glorious? And I think most of us, hopefully all of us, would say it's amazing. But in reality... We sometimes treat that very lightly, not by our words, but by the way we live. When we live in compromise, when we speak recklessly, when we have unforgiveness, when we live casually as if it didn't really matter, we're actually saying, Jesus, what you did for me really doesn't mean that much. What you suffered for me is not that important to me. In 1 Samuel 11:7. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. The fear of the Lord motivated the people of Israel to overcome their own fears, selfishness, and laziness, and to unite in their fight against the enemies of God. The fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. Isn't that wonderful? You know, because what was stopping the people from Israel from going forward? Well, first of all, they're selfish. Well, it's not affecting me right now, so let it's just the other Israelites. It's fear. Well, I don't want to go and fight them. Maybe I'll get killed or wounded. Maybe just a laziness. I just don't want to go. But what united them was the fear of the Lord. Dagim shared before, just a little while ago, how all the different churches in Ethiopia, irregardless of denominations, are being united. In fact, last week when I spoke about in my message, I gave us some stats on India. India had been a, Christian, a Hindu nation for millennia, 
And for many, many centuries, the Christian, at least for the last century or so, the population of Christians has been about 2%. It's holding steady about 2%. But persecution's been arising. And in the last 15 years, now there's between 20 and 25% Christians in, Hindu, in India. Hindus have come to Christ. There's 20 to 25%. Isn't that amazing? Some people think it's over 25%. In the last 15 years. Okay. And what the persecution has done, the persecution has not been the th key that has united the churches. You know what's been the key? The persecution has caused the people of God to seek God in prayer. As the reality of God came, the fear of the Lord came, then all of a sudden they realized they need to put down their di divisions and they need to be united. It was the fear of the Lord that brought forth unity, that oneness. The persecution caused the people to begin to pray and seek God. And as they began to pray and seek God, the reality of God became alive in the hearts of the people again and amongst the Christians again. And when the reality of God came, they realized this is wrong for us to be against our brothers because of different churches, different denominations. And because of that, they came together. The fear of the Lord will motivate us to step out in faith beyond our own self-centered desires and make those sacrifices that are needed so we can live holy, consecrated lives that bring glory to God and see many come to salvation. In Proverbs 14.26, Proverbs 14.26, In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. One of the wonderful things about the fear of the Lord is that it actually delivers and frees us from fear because it provides us with a strong confidence in God. The fear of the Lord actually gives you confidence. The fear of the Lord actually gives us a confidence. Christians who do not have the fear of the Lord often struggle with worries and uncertainties of this life. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. In other words, that when we have the fear of the Lord, we are confident in His faithfulness. Remembering God's faithfulness provides us with a peace that passes all understanding. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. I want to read that again. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. When a Christian is besieged by fear, worry, anxiety, and the uncertainties of the future, the most powerful things he or she can do is cultivate the fear of the Lord, knowing he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. In Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. The fear of the Lord will always keep us walking toward God and growing in a richer and richer life with Christ. One of the great problems with believers is inconsistency. Is inconsistency. <laughs> They're inconsistent. And the great thing that we can do is be consistent. And how do we be consistent? When we have the fear of the Lord. If a Christian is not experiencing an abiding satisfaction, it is because they are not walking in the fear of the Lord. If you are not satisfied with your life, if you don't have a deep satisfaction, that means we're lacking the fear of the Lord in some aspect. The reason the fear of the Lord causes us to abide in satisfaction is because we are conscious of the reality of God and what can be more satisfying than experiencing unbroken fellowship with Jesus. I remember when I first came to Christ, I remember this heaviness was lifted off, and I was so happy that I smiled for three days straight. But in the midst of that, in the midst of that, I knew that I was going to go through some really tough times when I told my dad that his good Jewish boy was now following Jesus. And it, it was about 15 years of heartbreak, but he finally came to Jesus too. But even though I knew that I was going to be rejected, I was going to have persecution, I was going to be spoken evil about, all sorts of people would see what kind of son I am, that I would do this to my father, a Holocaust survivor, and torment his soul. And those are things that people said.
But when I received Jesus, being aware of all of that, I was filled with joy. There was a deep satisfaction in my heart. Why? Because at that moment, the Lord was so real. God was so real. Jesus was so real. And for three days, I walked around with such a joy, even though I knew the uncertainty that I would have to face. Proverbs 23, 17. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Live in the fear of the Lord always. What a wonderful goal to live in the fear of the Lord always. This is the abiding principle of John 15, where the word abide is used 12 times, beginning with verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. And then continues, continuing by exhorting us to obey him so we will abide in his love, verse 10, and abide in his joy, verse 11. And ending with encouragement in verse 16 that we should bring forth fruit that will abide forever. Abide, abide, abide. But live in the fear of the Lord. Always abide. In Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Many times Christians are seeking to find that overflowing abundant life that Jesus promises us in John 10, 10. But they fail to cultivate the fear of the Lord with the result that the thief is able to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember that the fear of the Lord is also a treasury, a safe place where things will not be stolen. The fear of the Lord is not only a fountain, but it also causes to flee from temptation and compromise, resulting in us turning away from the snares of death. God's people are plundered when we fail to have the fear of the Lord and we make ungodly decisions or act in compromising ways that leads to ruin. That hurts the gospel so much. You see someone come to Christ, they're doing so well. They're freed from maybe addictions or freed from whatever their problems are, but then they stop cultivating the fear of the Lord and then they go back into compromise and the very things that they were freed from, they get ensnared again. And what does the world think? Oh, I thought you changed. But they had changed. But because they didn't have the fear of the Lord, they didn't continue walking in that freedom and growing in that freedom. In Proverbs 22, 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. The fear of the Lord results in a life that brings forth glory to God and eternal riches and rewards. You know, I'm so happy that, you know, 39 years ago I received Jesus. I was 20 years old and I received Jesus. You know why? Because I wasn't one of the better looking guys in our class. I wasn't the smartest guy in the class. I was just, I wasn't the best athlete. I ran fast, but I didn't seem to do much else. Mostly running from people. But anyways, um, <laughs> but the thing is that, but I'm so glad. Because you know something? My life has meaning. My life has meaning. And I don't look to old age with regret how I lived my life. But I think, how would it have been if I hadn't received Christ? Even if I had been successful, how would it have been? Now as I'm closing in on 60, it would have been sad. It would have been very sad. And I look at people who are getting old and they don't want to talk about it. They just want to keep busy because they stop and say, so what do you have to show for your life? But I'm so happy that I have riches in heaven because of God's grace in my life. And every morning I get up and I thank God that he saved me. But I thank God for the people in my life who witnessed to me those years who cared enough to share Christ with me. The fear of the Lord is something that not only believers can experience because for unbelievers, their encounter with God on Judgment Day will only be one of terror. The fear of the Lord is something that only is for believers to experience because un for unbelievers, their encounter with God on Judgment Day will only be one of terror. So we can't say the fear of the Lord is something that is for unbelievers because it's a treasure, it's a treasury, and it's a delight. But this is what the fear of the Lord is. Why it is something only for believers. Psalm 130 verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. For the fear of the Lord is founded on the very fact that forgiveness has been extended to us. That's why we can have the fear of the Lord. Because we couldn't have a delight if our sins were not forgiven. If all we looked at is God's wrath and judgment coming upon us, we couldn't have the fear of the Lord. It wouldn't be a treasure. 
The difference between the fear of the Lord and the terror of God is the first elicits hope and the second hopelessness. Do you understand that? That if before I knew God, before I knew Christ, before I, death was a scary thing. Death was a scary thing. So the unbelievers do not have the fear of the Lord because they don't, they're, they're not seeing their sins forgiven. But it says, but you may be feared, right? Because there is forgiveness with you. Because God forgives our sins, we can delight in him. We can come close to him because the fear of the Lord draws us close to Jesus. But the terror of God causes us to flee from God. There's another aspect of the fear of the Lord. It's not just reverential fear, but it says in, Pro, in Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 11, it says that even as a father chastises or disciplines his children, so the Lord does for us because he loves us. But when you have a father and you know you've done something really not good, and you, your dad comes and says, okay now, today we need to deal with that. You know he loves you, but you know it's not going to be really pleasant. But he's not chastising you out of anger. He shouldn't be. He's chastising you because he loves you and he wants you to stop your destructive behavior. But that's fearful too, isn't it? That's another aspect of the fear of the Lord. Is when you walk in sin, you recognize that God is going to bring chastisement on my life. Because he loves us and will not allow us to continue to walk in a destructive lifestyle. He will judge us for that. Not to destroy us, but so we can be holy. So how do we as believers develop the fear of the Lord in our lives? Proverbs 129. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. And they did not choose the fear of the Lord. The first thing we must understand is the fear of the Lord is not an experience which we wait for to happen, but a choice that we pursue. So people say, well, I'm praying for the fear of the Lord. I'm waiting for God to give me the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a choice. That's the very first thing I said. The fear of the Lord is a choice. Proverbs, I mean, Psalm 34.11. Psalm 34.11. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is something that we need to learn and be instructed in. The fear of the Lord is something that needs to be developed within our heart through the process of prayer, meditating upon God, the Lord, and His Word, and through godly fellowship. Some people try to develop the fear of the Lord by running after experiences, but this mindset can lead to confusion and instability. People are always going from meeting to meeting to have another supernatural experience to try to get that fear of God. It can lead to instability. It's not wrong to go to a meeting and experience God or to, 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 to fellowship. I'm not saying that. But if you're running there to try to get the fear of the Lord, to get a greater consciousness of God, you're going to become unstable. Because the fear of the Lord is something we choose and something we learn. You know, and what we do is, how do we develop the fear of the Lord? It's very simple. First of all, you have to choose to do it. And secondly, you need to do it. You need to actually carry it out. And what you do is, you first of all, you pray. You start to spend time. What I do is, every day I spend time just worshiping God, just thanking Him for salvation, just worshiping Him and loving Him and praising Him. And as I do, the reality of God fills my heart. I mean, that's the way I, I like to encourage everybody. We have that pre-service prayer every Sunday morning from 9 to 10. It's awesome. We have a Wednesday morning prayer meeting from 6 to 7.30, you know, in the morning. But I'm just saying, I know that most people can't make it, especially Wednesday morning. But the point is, but it's a delight to learn to spend time with God. You know, and when you start to... It's, people, it's not a list of prayer, a list of, of requests. It starts off with just worship and praising Him. And what we do is, as I'm doing that... And everybody who's done this can testify to this, is the reality of God fills our hearts. Brenda, remember that day you got filled with the Holy Spirit? Right? In the theater, right? She walks down. I never met this lady before. And I said to her, Brenda, would you like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues? And she goes, sure. Remember that? So we prayed for you and you just began to speak in tongues. Did that have a profound effect on your prayer life? Like God's, the reality of God touched you in a new way. But the thing is, but she chose to start to spend time in prayer. Right? I mean, that's what it was. She chose to spend. And all of a sudden, the reality of God. And I can, I can point out many people. I remember, well, 
Pat Hicks. I remember she came, and I had only seen her once before, and she came down. I said, would you like to be filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues? She goes, how did you know? And I said, well, I ask everybody. But anyways, <laughs> I didn't want to pretend I was so prophetic. So, um, <laughs> and I remember praying for her, and nothing happened for the first 10 minutes. And I think, this is a hard case, Lord. But anyways, we just kept praying, and then my son Jonathan came. We're all praying, and all of a sudden she said a word, and a second word, and a third word. She began to speak in tongues so powerfully, she could not speak in English, what, for nine hours? Three days, sorry, three days. She couldn't speak in English in three days. Every time, after we prayed for her, she was speaking in tongues, and this went on for about a half hour. I said, how are you doing now? She'd open her mouth and start speaking in tongues. In fact, she was so overwhelmed by the presence of God, we wouldn't let her drive. She would have had a DU DUI. <laughs> She was under the influence of the Holy Ghost. She was so overwhelmed. So we sent her home. Somebody drove her home. And then Pat, Larry comes and sees his wife. He comes from another church. Sorry, brother. So anyways, um, and, and she is speaking in tongues so much. You know what he did is? He took out his video camera. He started videoing his wife. He goes, wow. Because, and that was the fear of the Lord. Like, wow, this is so real. Did that not transform your life when you experienced God and then you chose to follow that? And I remember after a few weeks, Larry was going for prayer, but he, wasn't, he didn't get anything, and he was getting discouraged. So one day I phoned him up and said, Larry, you want to come over? So he said, sure. He came over. He thought he just wanted to talk. I didn't want to talk. I wanted to pray. <laughs> and another brother was with us, Dale. And so um, I just said, can we pray for you to be filled with the Spirit? Just, just enjoy the Lord. Don't make this into a, an emotional thing. Don't make this into a stressful thing. Let's just pray. So we began praying, and after a few minutes, he started speaking in tongues. And you know something? He couldn't speak in English either. He could just speak in tongues. I said, just go home, talk to your wife now. <laughs> but, I mean, but the reality of God changed their lives. It changed your prayer life, didn't it? It transformed them. It's not speaking in tongues only. It's the reality that God is real, but then they pursued that. So that's the first thing is prayer. The second thing is read the word of God and wait on God. Sometimes I'll spend an hour reading the Bible, but I only may read a few chapters. Maybe I'll read a few verses, but I'll just read it. And if it touches me, I just want that reality of God that, that's in that scripture. And sometimes I, I read, nothing happens. It doesn't matter. Just keep reading. But when I find something that, that the Holy Spirit touches me with, I park on it and I wait and I spend time thinking about it. And the third thing is, Share what God has already done supernatural in your life. Tell people. I love telling testimonies what God has done. You know why? Because every time I tell it, it reminds me. It reminds me. And when I get rem reminded, it brings the fear of the Lord in my life. It brings the fear of the Lord in my life. I go, wow. I remember when God healed that person. And I remember when God answered that prayer. And I, that was, and I, I started to go, that is so amazing. So what I do is, is I'm recounting it, and I'm also, what? Learning the fear of the Lord. I'm, develop, I'm cultivating it. You, get, you, you see that? Those are three things, three ways. There's, I'm not saying those are only three ways for us to develop that. In fact, I remember, but, but the fear of the Lord is not running after experience. I remember a friend of mine, Joshua Gordon, he's a, a Spanish brother from uh, Mexico, and uh, he's a young man in his early 20s. And one day he was worshiping God and praying, and the presence of God came upon him in such a tangible way. Such a tangible way. It was so unbelievable, the presence of God. And he said, God, let this never stop. Let this never stop, this experience. And the Lord spoke to him. You know what the Lord said? That's not for now, that's for heaven. That's not for now, that's for heaven. You know, in my life as a Christian in 39 years, I probably had four or five powerful, profound experiences with God where I've been literally overwhelmed physically with His presence. Maybe three or four. Three or four. But the thing is, I don't need to have those experiences daily to give me the fear of the Lord. In fact, that's not what's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a consciousness of His reality. Not having a feeling every time, but a consciousness that God is real. He's given me those experiences so I can think back on them and say, wow, I remember when God did that. And so remembering it helps me develop the fear of the Lord. 
Remembering it. It's not like I have to have that experience again to have the fear of the Lord. No. What he's done, if he never did another miracle in my life, it should be enough what he's done because of all the miracles he's done, the experience he's done. If I just recall all those things, those things themselves would be enough for me to continue to stir up the reality of the fear of God, the reality of his love and his faithfulness to me. When we encounter the miraculous and the power of the Holy Spirit, that does not mean we've arrived. Experiencing miracles, wonders, and signs is not the destination, but the invitation for us to either begin or continue in our journey with the Lord to deepen our consecration and spiritual maturity. And on this path, we will learn and develop the fear of the Lord. When you have a supernatural experience with God, that isn't like, okay, this is what I need to have all the time. No, that is not the destination, that is the invitation. God has said, I've let you experience something of me so you can retain that memory and then you can build on the reality of who I am so that even when you feel nothing, you can be confident I'm always with you. That's the fear of the Lord. It's not a feeling, it's faith. Second Chron- Second Corinthians 5, 7 Chronicles 2 Second Corinthians 5.7 For we walk by faith and not by sight. The sign of spiritual maturity is not found in the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but the development of the fruit of the Spirit, godly character. When it says that we walk by faith and not by sight, it means that many times it may not appear as if God is doing something, but he actually is. When we walk by faith and not by sight, then our faith produces the fear of the Lord because we look directly to God for assurance and not the circumstances. See, godly fear of God, the uh, fear of God, true faith, is we don't look to circumstances to confirm if God is faithful, but we look directly to God himself. We look directly to God himself to say, you are faithful, no matter how things may appear or may not appear. <coughs> The fear of the Lord guarantees that we will, de- uh, we will keep on the right path and we will produce godly faith, fruit. In Galatians 2, 11 to, 4, 11 to 14, Galatians 2, 11 to 14, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to blame. For before certain men came to James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? In Galatians 2, we can learn something about the fear of the Lord from Peter's example. The fear of the Lord is something that needs to be maintained daily, otherwise it can grow weak. The fear of the Lord needs to be maintained daily. In other words, every day you need to start the day. Why do we start our day in prayer? Why? Because we want to maintain the reality of God. Peter, who boldly preached the first evangelical sermon in history, recorded in Acts 2, Free from the fear of the Jewish leader, religious leaders, now a few years later found himself with quite a different attitude. Peter, cry, uh, Peter acted in a hypocritical way because, one of the, because fearing those who were of the circumcision, he separated himself from the Gentile believers. Now Peter, who before preached boldly, now he sees Jewish believers who come who want to keep the law and he's fearful and when they come he separates himself from Gentile believers. What happened to Peter? Peter had not kept his full attention on Jesus and his word, and very suddenly he began to be affected by the opinions of men, and before he knew it, he was being influenced by the fear of man instead of the fear of God. If Peter's eyes were firmly focused on Jesus, he would not have been influenced by the opinions of men. Peter's actions could very well have resulted in the church falling into legalism, but by God's mercy, Paul brought strong correction to Peter and refocused him back on the truth and on Jesus Christ. What, what, what was Paul, Peter's attitude towards Paul, who had so publicly rebuked him when he had gone off into error? This is what he said in 2 Peter. Beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom, give, uh, the wisdom give to him, given to him, uh, uh, sorry, according to the wisdom given to him, was ri- uh, I must have done something wrong with my PowerPoint here, but it's okay. Uh, but it says, beloved brother Paul, Peter was very appreciative of Paul. Um, 
Peter was very appreciative of Paul in the ministry God had given Paul and the correction he had received from him. This is truly the sign of a godly man who desired to please Christ. In other words, Peter said, I'm so thankful for my beloved brother Paul who had the revelation and who came and corrected me publicly, not only for my sake, but for the sake of the church. But how did Peter end his life? 2 Peter 1, verse 13 and 14. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. We can see that Peter continued his life and ended it faithfully with the fear of the Lord, not fearing men nor martyrdom. He's saying, I'm ready to die now, just like Jesus said, I'm ready to die as a martyr. See, he maintained the fear of the Lord to the very last day of his life. And because of Paul's correction, he got focused back on God and not on men. Proverbs 2, verses 4 and 5. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If we pursue God with our whole hearts and seek to understand God's word, then we will understand the fear of the Lord. In order to find, develop, and mature in the fear of the Lord is something that we must pursue daily but the fruit is eternal. In other words, we need to daily seek to have the reality of God in our lives. Acts 9.31 Then the church, churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. The early church walked in the fear of the Lord and the message of the gospel was unstoppable and even the entire might of the Roman Empire was incapable of stopping it. When the fear of God is upon just that group of believers, the entire Roman Empire could not crush it. But in fact, it pushed through the whole Roman Empire because the fear of the Lord provides strength and confidence. However, in general, the church in the Western world has been more effective in changing the church than the church has been in changing the world. Isn't that true? In the Western world, the church has been, uh, the world has been more effective in changing the church than the church has been changing the world. You see the standards in the church coming down. The key for the decline of the gospel in the West has been a lack of fear of the Lord in the church. But the good news is that God is once again awakening believers to seek Him and to seek the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to live intentionally for the glory of God. The fear of the Lord is to live intentionally for the glory of God. Right now, I want to show you a, a short video, a testimony. And in this testimony, the fear of the Lord is not mentioned once. But if you listen, based on what I've just said, you will find it permeating the entire story. And it's, it's about, and the brother who's giving his testimony, he's from California, but Peter and Laurel Firth, their daughter know him personally. And he's really a fun guy. But I want you just to hear this testimony, and then afterwards I'm going to summarize. But listen to it, and pay attention where you can see the fear of the Lord throughout the story. Could we run that, please? Me and a friend felt like we were supposed to go on a two-week visit into Iran and uh, had a great time and uh, fell in love with the country, fell in love with the people. While we were leaving the country, it was crossing the border. We hand in our documents to be stamped out of the country and we didn't get them back. And it was about six hours later that they finally came back to us and said, there's a problem with your documents. And the reality is that I had dealt with before I went, like what if you have a problem? What if there could be complications being an American? Yeah, it all came to the surface. And I realized, wow, I could really have a problem. Like this is for real. And um, yeah, in my walk with the Lord and in many dangerous places, I've always seen God come through. And all of a sudden the thought hit me, well, what if this is different? They separated me and my friend, took me into another room, and there they beat me for about six hours, kicking me and hitting me. After those six hours, they dragged me back down to the lobby where I met my friend again who had been beaten in another room. They put us in prison clothes, and they blindfolded us again, and then they led us down this basement, and they put me into one prison cell and my friend into another one. 
And there I was in prison in Iran. It was out of my hands. There was nothing I could do. Either God would do a miracle or I would stay there. There was no sense of feeling God. I, I felt like God was far away. All I could really trust in was his character and that his character would be true no matter what I was feeling and no matter what circumstance I was going through. They put me in a cell in isolation, had a light in one corner, and that was on 24 hours a day. It was in the winter time, there was actually snow outside, but the heater didn't work well. They only let me out of the room to be interrogated, which was once a day or sometimes not at all. And then they would lead me down this hallway and take me into the interrogation room which was an ugly room. It had blood stains on the floor, very dark and murky. It was definitely the most terrifying part of the whole experience. The beatings would start and it would be slapping in the face, hitting in the stomach, sometimes kicking. I struggled with faith. Uh, was God with me? Did he love me? If God's good, why would he allow me through the situation? And I remember one day I woke up and I was done, you know, inside. And I remember waking up that day thinking to myself, if I'm going to be here the rest of my life, why not check out? My only thought was not to stay there. And the only way not to stay there was to die. I, I stuck my head in the sink. I filled it up and tied one end to a bracket, put it over my head, and then hopefully would tie the other end tight, thinking that, you know, with my head in the water, in a few minutes I'd be gone. Four times I tried to kill myself, but every time I tried, I was too scared to tie the other end. And I'll never forget the last time. Again, I tried, again, I was like, come on, do it. And again, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't tie it tight. And I remember at that moment, jerking my head out of the water. And if I was ever aware of my brokenness, I was aware of it at that moment. And I remember falling down on the ground and I was broken. And if I was ever aware of my shame, I was aware of my shame at that moment. And I remember lying down on the ground in that moment, all of a sudden the room fills with this glorious light. And I turn around to see what's going on and there is Jesus. And he's standing in front of me with this big grin and smile on his face. And it was at that lowest point that he met me. And he looks at me and he stretches out his hands and he puts them underneath me like this. And in the vision, as I see Jesus, he looks at me and says this. He says, Dan, I love you. And I promise to carry you through this time. And from that day until this day, I've never had those thoughts again. And that's who Jesus is. He meets us at our lowest and he can rescue us from the depths of us and he wants to give us life in the midst of the pain of life. And he meets us and he loves us and he wants to rescue us no matter what we're going through. God began to challenge me with his love for our enemies. And he said this, he's like, Dan, ask me what I think about this man. And he asked me the question about the man who was my interrogator, the man who beat me, the man who seemed to hate me the most. And it was a few days into it that I finally asked God, okay, yeah, what do you think of this man? And at that moment, yeah, my heart opened up and I began to see God's love for this man, how he loved him from the beginning, how he made him, how he loved his family. And I'll never forget the last day I saw him. I remember on this day thinking, oh my gosh, what's he going to do today? And at that moment, I remember looking at him and I said this. I said, sir, if I'm going to see you the rest of my life every day, why don't we become friends? He's like, no, that's impossible. And I said, sir, you can start by telling me your name. And I stuck out my hand to him and I said, sir, let's be friends. And as I stuck out my hand to shake his hand, he just stood there and he froze. And after a few minutes, he started to shake. And then all of a sudden, I saw his hand creep towards mine, and he shook my hand. And as he's shaking my hand, I saw these tears start to roll down his face. And for about 10 minutes, he just shook my hand, and tears streaming down his face. And he finally looks at me, and he says this. He's like, Dan, and he calls me by my name. 
My name is Razak, and I would love to be your friend. And it caused me to see that there is no heart too hard for Jesus, that he can change the hardest heart. God taught me to love my enemy. I heard these guards talking about the foreigners, me and my friend. They're Christians, they follow Jesus. And then another one was said, oh, these foreigners, they knew they could have problems when they came here, but they have purpose. They've got a reason to live and a reason to die. And that's what I want. And I heard three of these men say, yeah, today we are gonna follow Jesus. We are gonna follow the way. And if that was part of the reason why God allowed me down there, uh, yeah, so be it. And just like, yeah, those guards in prison, I, I long for people to know today how good Jesus is, that he can rescue us in the midst of pain, in the midst of our shame, our brokenness. He wants to meet us and that he is good no matter what we're going through and that he loves us. I found out indirectly that I was under two death sentences, one for being a missionary, one for being a spy. And again, in that prison, I heard executions, yeah, quite regularly. And it was my moment in a courtroom. I stood on the stand, hundreds of people in the room, video cameras, judges. And then came the question, tell us today, sir, why? Why did you come to Iran? Something rose up within me that, yeah, the power of God. And I remember looking at the judge and saying this, I came to Iran to tell you about Jesus Christ. And when I said that, I'm like, oh, what did I say? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I said it again. And then I said it again. And then something started to grow in my heart. And for about 20 minutes, I just preached the gospel. And I told everyone in that courtroom, and I told everyone who could hear me all about who Jesus is, all about how much he loved him. All of a sudden, I realized something. I am free. I am free. So what if they kill me? My life is bought by the blood of Jesus. My home is in heaven and no one can take that away. And I realized that in the midst of death itself, God gave me the grace to stand up and speak the truth. And in doing so, it brought freedom in my heart, knowing that this life isn't it. There is more and I'm going home one day and no one can take that away. cell and uh, at this point my friend had been released he'd been released a few weeks before me I knew about that and again that brought questions of like why is he going and not me yeah it was just one morning where they just came to my cell and they opened it up they walked me down to this room and they said get dressed and I thought well this is my day of execution why else would I be getting dressed yeah I went to the courthouse where I'd been before and it was there that I sat down and in walks the uh, head judge of all the courts of Iran. And to my surprise, <laughs> he stands up and reads this testimony or this statement. And it basically said, because of our friendship with the nation of Switzerland, uh, again, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I've been, I've been traveling on a Swiss passport. My dad is Swiss, I'm a dual citizen. And uh, yeah, he says, because of our friendship with the nation of Switzerland, we choose to release Dan Bauman, and he's a free man. And I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and I thought I was gonna die, and God said no. <laughs> and yeah, the Swiss ambassador was in the room, and he walks up to me, and he said, Mr. Bauman, you're coming with me. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> And I remember walking into his car and locking those doors. And yeah, that was the beginning of the rest of my life. You know, God rescuing me from myself, rescuing me from, from that prison cell. And for real, it was for real, I was free. That was the beginning of a new life. And the freedom to look at the sky and the freedom to go for a walk, the freedom to call a friend on the phone, and all the freedoms I'd taken for granted, God gave them all back to me. Yeah, there's challenges in our lives and there's challenges in the world, but God's great. And nothing compares to his greatness. Nothing compares to his power. And if he can pull me out of a prison cell three stories down in the middle of Iran with death sentences on my life, he can rescue anyone. And he can rescue us from whatever we're going through. 
and it just gave me a big picture of how, how great he is in the midst of, of life. So uh, now as you've heard that testimony and for what I taught in the fear of the Lord, do you see the fear of the Lord permeating that testimony? Yeah. Do you see that? The first part when he was imprisoned and things were really difficult, he said, I didn't feel anything, I didn't feel God, but I continued to trust his character. So the fear of the Lord was carrying him through. And then when he came where he started to take his eyes off of that reality and look at his circumstances, he lost the fear of the Lord, he became despairing. And then in the midst of wanting to kill himself even because he was so despairing, Jesus shows up. And I love this part. Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus looked at him. He's lying on the floor. His body is soaked from trying to stick his head into the sink. And Jesus looks at him and has this huge smile and love for him. And he says, Dan, I love you. He says, and just I want you to trust me that I'll carry you through this time. And he said, from that time on, he's never had those thoughts of suicide again. So what do we see here? Is it wasn't just the experience. The experience was invitation. But it wasn't like every day Jesus appeared to him like that. That happened once in his lifetime. But it was, is that he can now cultivate the reality of God. Say, God, I can trust you. No matter how difficult things are, no matter how painful life can get sometimes, I can trust you because you're always here. Even if I don't see you with my physical eyes, I can see you with my eyes of faith. I can see you with my eyes of faith. And so I'd like to just encourage each one here to cultivate the reality of Jesus, the reality of God's love, to think back. And if you're, if you're a new Christian and you don't have a lot of experiences yet, talk to other Christians, let them share things that God has done. When I'm down, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, even now I've been a believer for almost 40 years, what do I do? I pick up the phone and phone up brothers and say, let's talk about the Lord. Let's talk. I'll even say, let's, remember that time that God healed that person? Can you tell me about that again? Or remember when the Lord, and tell me it again, or I'll tell them. And what am I doing? I'm cultivating that reality. I'm cultivating that reality. And so I want to encourage everyone here, whatever you're going through, just to say, you know, I'm going to start to really dedicate every day to just to know Jesus more. We have a prayer team coming forward now. Those who want prayer, those who want to thank God for things God has done in your life, you can come forward and pray too. It's not just like if you have a need. You may say, I want to share with somebody what God has done. I want to just give thanks. But let's just go back into worship and those who... Uh, want to pray in your seats, that's great. If you want to come up and just pray right here on your own, that's wonderful too. You know, or you can pray with the brothers and sisters that are going to be willing to pray for you. Let's just turn to the Lord. Thank you, Father. I thank you. You're so wonderful to us, Lord. You're so wonderful to each one of us, Father. And I pray, Lord, that you would just move in our hearts, Lord, in a fresh way, Lord. I pray for those that are discouraged this morning, Father, to be encouraged in your presence. I pray for those that are rejoicing, Lord, to take hold of that, Father, and to grow in that, Father. Oh, God, wherever we're at, we meet, you meet us in every need. You meet us in every point of our lives, Father. And we're so thankful that you do meet us, Lord. You do meet us in every situation we're in, Father. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your love. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank Thank you, Father, for the gospel message, that good news of the salvation we have through Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who's never received Christ, I pray right now your Holy Spirit would touch them, Father, and to bring them, Father, to a place where they can find Jesus. Lord, as we just open our hearts, Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here who does not know you, Lord, that you would touch them. And as they just open their hearts and just confess their sins, confess their sinfulness, and put their faith in you, you will save them, Lord, even now, even this morning, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah.